Hi everyone, my name is Jen, I'm an author and a book reviewer and I thought I would start a new reading vlog today. Please bear with the voice. I'm hoping it recovers very soon and starts to sound more like my actual voice in the coming clips. As I said, I want to start a new reading vlog today. I need to film this video so that I am able to film the next video I want to film, which is one that you've requested quite a lot. So I'm often asked, for instance, Jen, what are your favorite Persephone books? Persephone is one of my favorite small presses. They republish or reissue books, mainly by women that are out of print, and um, they have a bookshop too, and they're just great. So I had thought of doing a dedicated video where I recommend Persephone books only. I still wanna do a reading vlog where I only read their books in that video. But instead of doing a recommendation book solely for one publisher, I thought what would be more interesting and more helpful to you is if I do a video where I recommend my top three books by say 10 small presses. That way I can shout about lots of different publishers that I love and it's a more comprehensive and helpful list for you. So I have sat down and I have made a list of some of my favorite presses and the books that they publish. But there's one press, one more press, that I want to include in that video, but I haven't read enough of their books yet. So we're going to do a reading vlog today where I read, I think the total is 16 books that they publish, and then I can talk to you about all of them in this video, and then my top three can be included in that next video. So the press that I want to talk about today is called Strangers Press. They are based in Norwich and they publish work in translation. They have four different sets of um books or chat books and one set let me move over here so i can insert some pictures for you to see because the covers are stunning they have a set of korean work in translation which includes work by um han kang and bae sua and lots of other people they have a set of work in translation from japanese writers which includes work by yoko matsuda and yoko tawada and lots of other fabulous people then there is a set that they publish of work in translation from the dutch and also a set of books from switzerland which includes many different languages translated so in this video what i would like to do is read all of the work that they have translated from japanese and all of their translated korean books as well and i'm really excited about this because not only are these some beautifully published works, but also they're really helpful to help you find writers that you might want to read more from. And that's certainly been the case for me. It's how I discovered Besua. I read her um, piece here, which is Milena, Milena Ecstatic, and then went on to read Untold Night and Day, which is one of my favorite books of last year. It's also happened the other way around. As I said, Hong Kong is one of the um, writers published by them and I have read her work before. I've read The Vegetarian, The White Book and Human Acts and then came to this last and actually didn't enjoy this one very much, but we'll get on to that one later. For the most part, I found the work that they publish really thought provoking and intriguing, surreal, lots of layering. And we're going to talk about all of that in this video. As always with my reading vlogs, I will take you on some walks and we'll do some cooking as well. Um, we're also looking after Lola at the moment for the next few days, who is my mum-in-law's dog for anyone who is new. She's a little Jack Chi and she is rather adorable. So I'm sure you will see footage of her as well. So that's the introduction of this video um, and I will come back to you and talk to you when my throat hopefully sounds a little bit less like this and I have bookish things to say and in the meantime I feel like I would quite like to make some hot cross buns so let's do that and I'll link the recipe in the description box down below for anybody who would like it.
Hi everyone, it's a couple of days later, it's the morning, I'm still in my pyjamas and I thought I would film the next clip of this vlog. As I think I mentioned in the last clip, there are 16 books in total in these two sets. So there's eight from Japan, eight from Korea, and before I started filming this vlog I'd already read six of them. Some of those I read nearly four years ago now, so I've just read them over the last four year period and then what I'm going to do is read the other 10 throughout the next week and talk to you about them but before I dive into the ones I haven't read I thought I would briefly talk to you about those six. I haven't gone back to them because I didn't really want to refresh my memory. I feel like the whole point of this video is to talk about which books are favourites, which ones are stand out and then in the case of the ones I've already read which ones have stayed with me. What I would like to do for all 16 books is review them very quickly because they're quite short and then also talk about other books these authors have written, whether or not I have read those or would now like to. I'm possibly purchasing a couple of books in this video by these authors because that sounds like something I would do. So let's talk about the six books that I have already read. The first one that I ever came across and my introduction to this publisher was At the Edge of the Wood by Masatsuko Ono. I came across this in foils in 2019 and I was intrigued by it. I think they had other books from the series there. I don't really remember. I only bought this one, then read it, then went online, checked out the publisher and decided to read more of what they publish. This one is translated from the Japanese by Juliet Winters Carpenter. And I remember enjoying this one, but not absolutely loving it. I remember being intrigued by it. It's set in a wood and it's about a father, a mother and a son. The mother is pregnant again and the father says that she should go and stay with family because he's worried about her miscarrying in these woods. To do with folklore, I think, there's, there's something weird going on and he's very unsettled by it. And I have underlined some lines in here, so I thought that I would read those to you. The trees pat each other familiarly on the shoulders and back and sometimes wriggle their hips as they hurry on ahead. They huddle their green leaves together, absorbed in whispering, paying us no mind. When he gets tired from walking, he gets out of sorts. Monotonous whispers in the wood begin again to fill everything. They steal across the back of his neck and into his ears. They beckon him to sleep. And then later I underlined this line, light slowly filled the window as if someone had tipped over a big jar of mourning. So I love all those lines that I had underlined four years ago. And yeah, I love that image of trees walking along with you as you're walking through the woods that eerie feeling when you're walking past lines of trees that you're not moving but the rest of the forest is i thought that was really great so what was really intriguing is that i then looked up this author not four years ago today i looked up this author today and they have published a book with exactly the same title apart from it's got an s on the end so at the edge of the woods by Masatsuko Ono, and it's also translated by the same translator, Juliet Winters Carpenter. It was published last year uh, by a different publisher, and it's, um, I think, about 200 pages long, which is longer than this because this is a chapbook. So I think this must be an extract from that, and I think I do want to read that. I'll insert the cover here. This definitely worked as a standalone. I remember reading it and really enjoying it and not thinking, where's the rest of it? But I do want to read the whole book if it was later turned into something longer. I'm definitely going to pick up the longer version of that. I also read this, which is translated by Polly Barton, who wrote a non-fiction book called 50 Sounds. This is Mukamari, um, it's by Masumi Kobo. I remember this being very sexually explicit about, um, I think it's a teacher and an older student, and they embark on this affair where they sleep together dressed up in cosplay. And I remember, I think, being a little bit baffled by it, but also finding it very readable. And again, I've looked up this author and this story is now also part of a longer text. I can't remember the name of it. I'll insert the title here, actually. Let me find it on my computer because that will be more helpful. It's called We Look to the Sky and it says that it's five linked stories. It begins with this one, Mary and it goes on to four more different stories and the reason I'm intrigued by this specifically is because Naomi Alderman has said in the author quotes that it reminded her a lot of The Vegetarian by Hong Kong which I do love so I think maybe I will pick that one up and check it out in the future. Speaking of Hong Kong who wrote The Vegetarian I also read her pamphlet in this series called Europa. This is translated from the Korean by Deborah Smith. I read this the most recently. I read this in December. 
I can't tell you anything about this, as in I do not remember it. I remember not enjoying it. I remember feeling as though it was a little bit of nothing, which sounds very harsh, but that's what my memory of this book is. And I've read her work before. I've read The Vegetarian, which I really loved. I read Human Acts, which I very much respect. I read The White Book, which I also enjoyed. I'm looking forward to reading her new book, Greek Lessons, which is coming out later this year, but this one didn't really do anything for me at all. I also read Milena Milena Ecstatic by Bae Sua, and this is translated from the Korean by Deborah Smith again. This one I did really enjoy, and then it made me go and pick up more work by Besoir, which I have also really enjoyed. This, as I remember it, is a book about film and about wanting to create film and looking to everyday life as inspiration for a film that you want to create, looking at the people around you as though you're their writer or their director, and it gets quite intimate, quite meta, I would actually, thinking about it, quite like to reread this alongside Children of Paradise, which is one of the long-listed books for the Women's Prize, because I think that that would be really interesting, their discussion on film and how you could compare and contrast those two things. I then went on to read her book Untold Night and Day, which is a very sleepy book, and I mean sleepy in a dreamlike way and it's about two characters who are walking around Seoul at night in the summer. It's very hot and it again has that blend of characters, fictional real worlds and film in this case, um, it being set at a theatre for blind people where actors narrate audiobooks in a dark room. I absolutely loved it and I've since then gone on and bought two more of her books where is my notebook? There is my notebook, because I've written down which ones I have on my shelf. I've bought North Station, which is a short story collection, and I also have A Greater Music, which is a queer story about a young writer who falls into a freezing river, and I'm just really intrigued by that one. She's also published a couple of other things, but I'm trying to be well behaved and not purchasing those until I have read those two. I've also read Friendship for Beginners by Naokoli Yamazaki, which has the most beautiful cover. This is translated from the Japanese by Polly Barton. If I'm remembering correctly, this one is about evolution. It talks about genealogy and kind of mirrors that with the evolution of a relationship between two people who lose touch but talk every few years on the phone. And I like this one a lot, but I've looked up the author and whilst they have written lots of other books, they haven't been translated into English, but they have one story in the Book of Tokyo, which is published by Comma Press. They do anthologies of work um, based around specific cities or countries. And I haven't read that anthology yet, but I do have it on my shelf. So yes, I did enjoy this one. And the final one I've read but I haven't spoken about yet is Kyoko Yoshida's Spring Sleepers. This one isn't translated because she writes in English. And I remember really liking this one. It's about a character called Yuki who can't get to sleep. And at first the character is really proud that they're not sleeping. As a business person that's seen as something that gives you elevated status, you can get more done, your mind is more evolved than other people's, but then the longer this goes on, their memory starts to disintegrate and they go to a sleep clinic to try and fix it, but they know that they won't get to the sleep clinic in time to help their memory and it becomes really disjointed and very, very eerie. I loved it. And I know that this author has written a short story called, like, a short story collection called Disorientalism. And I'm definitely going to purchase that one and read it in the future because I enjoyed this writing very much. So those are the six books that I've already read. Um, I'm going to crack on and read the other 10. I'll check in with you once I've read two or three so we can talk about them in little chunks as we go. So I will see you in a bit. Hello. For the first two new books I'm going to be reading in this video, or have now read in this video, I decided to go for authors whose work I'd read before. I started with Yoko Tawada's book Time Differences. I have had a real hit and miss relationship with her books in the past. I read Scattered All Over the Earth in last year. Last year it was 2022 and I absolutely hated it. I think it was my worst book of 2022 pretty much. I really thought it was a bit of a mess and I have also read the beginning of her book Memoirs of a Polar Bear and really enjoyed it. I also have Last Children of Tokyo on my shelf as well which is a 
dystopian type book which I hope to read at some point and I'm so glad that I enjoyed this book because it makes me eager to get back to Memoirs of a Polar Bear and also read Children of Tokyo. Yoko Tawada is an author who could make anyone feel as though they are not accomplished because she writes in both Japanese and German and she's also published about 20 books as well. This chapbook here, Time Differences, is about three queer men who live in Tokyo, Berlin and New York and they're all on different time zones and they're all thinking about each other but kind of in this triangle. No one is really having their affection mirrored back at them. Each of these characters is looking ahead to the next person and I think that beautifully reflects time differences as well. The sections aren't broken up very clearly so a new perspective will start on the next line and you'll realise a couple of sentences in, oh we've moved to the next person now and that creates almost a jet lag type feeling. It can be a little bit frustrating at times because you have to go back on yourself and re-establish where you are but I think it's done for a deliberate reason and I, I respect that. I'll put in the extra work, that's okay. Weirdly, and I don't think I've ever had this before, or at least it hasn't happened very often, when I was reading this, I could picture this as a graphic novel. I think it would work amazingly as a graphic novel, maybe with different color palettes for each character. I just thought that would be quite cool. So yeah, I would definitely recommend that one. And I now want to get back to reading Memoirs of a Polar Bear at some point in the not too distant future. And then I've also read Left's Right, Right's Left by Han Yuju, which is translated from the Korean by Janet Hong. I have read Han Yuju before and had, again, a mixed experience, but a mixed experience within the same book. She wrote a book called The Impossible Fairy Tale. I have the US edition, which is so beautiful. It looks like this. It's now also published in the UK by Tilted Axis and looks like this. Impossible Fairy Tale is about a unnamed child called The Child who goes to school and has a feud with another girl in her class called Mia and to create chaos in the classroom the child sneaks in during break time and writes in everyone's notebooks, writes secrets about the other person and makes everyone start accusing each other. She then goes home and she's thinking about how she is in control of the narrative of her school. That's the first half of the book and I liked it. And then the second half is told from the point of view of the author who is controlling this character and working out what to do with them. So it's all about the layering of stories and who gets to control narratives. And I thought it was very interesting, but overall I liked the premise of it more than reading the book itself. And that's kind of how I felt about this book too. In Left's Right, Right's Left, a woman is on a stairwell and she's trying to get away from her partner who's grabbed her hair and is trying to pull her quite viciously back into their apartment. And while she's on these stairs, not knowing if she's going up or down, she starts thinking back on her life and telling you about it, but she can't really think straight because she's in quite a lot of pain. The first sentence of this chat book says, whenever the first sentence doesn't come to me, I open someone else's book. In books, I'm always able to find a first sentence, sentences I didn't write, which makes you question everything that she is telling you. She keeps saying things like, let me tell you about how I remember this particular experience in my life allowing room for her to get it wrong or reinterpret it in the way that she would like to display it to you. She describes a couple of instances where characters lose the keys to their own flats, their own apartments, and that seems to be a metaphor for getting locked out of your own life. And there is a line here which says, I realized gradually some people can only voice something after they've become ghosts. They'd had voices before, they just hadn't been able to attract any attention. Then she goes on to talk about a friend of hers who had died, so she's able to give voice to this friend because they're no longer there, but it also makes you wonder whether at the end of this book she's going to fall and die herself, and that's why she is able to tell us this narrative. It's very hazy, it's very uncertain, and that is deliberate. So I'm glad to have read it, but I'm not sure if I'll be picking up any other work by Han Yuji. But mind you, I don't think any other work has been translated, so I don't think I even have that choice right at this second. Those are the two books I've read so far. I think Mr. M and I are now gonna go on a walk through the woods. It's baby squirrel season. They're out and about at the moment, they're super cute. So I'm sure I'll be able to film a clip of that. So I'll insert that here and I'll come back to you when I have read some more.
I had the best luck today. It is Lauren's daughter's birthday soon. I'm sure many of you followed Lauren. Uh, she is Lauren Wade Reads and her daughter Edith's birthday is soon. And I thought I should really be buying a book for her because you know, I'm that book friend slash aunt who gifts the books. And I remembered reading a picture book that Thames and Hudson published called The Fluffy Squishy Itty Bitty. I'll insert the cover here. And it's just really charming about a young girl who's trying to find a birthday present for her mum that she thinks she will like. And I thought that would be quite fun because it's a lovely book, it has great pictures, but also Lauren's birthday is a couple of weeks after her daughter's. So I was like, right, I'm gonna purchase that. And I have a copy of it on my shelf, but I didn't revisit it because I know that I love it. And then it arrived in the post and I opened it and the name of the little girl in the book is Lauren's daughter's name, Edith. And I had forgotten that. Maybe I subconsciously remembered somehow, but I was like, this is great. I'm gonna pretend I did this on purpose. I didn't do it on purpose. Anyway, that was my good luck today, which was lovely. And I'm now here to talk to you about three more of these books. One of these authors I've read from before, so let's start there. This is Kong's Garden by Huang jung Yun, and it's translated from the Korean by jung Sung hee I have read 100 Shadows by this author, which is pu published by Tilted Axis Books. This is a dystopian book looking at capitalism and technology, and then I've also read a book by her called I'll Go On, which was one of my favourite books last year. It's a book about found family and I just thought that it was delightful. This is two stories set in a bookshop, so what's not to love about that? I found this to be very moving. It's about a girl who has worked from a very young age because she's from a very poor family. She was also quite sick in her youth. She had TB and her mum was also quite ill. And when she recovered, she went out to earn money for her parents. And then later she gets this job working in a bookstore. And one day this young girl comes to the counter and asks to buy some cigarettes which is maybe a strange thing to buy from a bookstore, but I, I guess they also sell cigarettes here. And she won't sell her the cigarettes because she thinks she's underage. And then later it turns out that this girl has gone missing. In the second story, the mother's still looking for her daughter and she keeps coming back to the bookshop. She feels a lot of animosity towards our narrator because she was the last person to see her daughter alive. In both stories, there's a group of kittens with their mother living in a basket right outside the bookshop. They've been rehoused there by the bookstore owner and and this symbolizes both family relationships, actually, the one of the narrator who feels a sense of home and solace in this bookshop, but also the mother who is looking for her daughter and is hoping to be reunited with her family in this bookshop, but to no avail. I thought this was very haunting. I liked it a lot. I would love to read more work by this author, but I've read everything that's currently published. They have a new book, which was supposed to be coming out later this year. It's now listed as coming out in 2024, and it is called Dee Dee's Umbrella, I think. There's no cover, no blurb, no anything, but I look forward to reading that when it's out. Next, I read Kang Wigil's book, which is translated by Matto Mandersloot, and this is called Demons. It's about a woman who's a teacher in a rural town, and she believes that there's a lot of bullying going on in her class. She's trying to get to the root of it. She's also trying to talk to her daughter, Mia, who is spending a lot of time with her mother-in-law and she's not sure that she likes the way her mother-in-law is bringing her up when she's not around. She feels this loss of control when it comes to parenthood. And at first it feels very matter of fact, but then it slips into the surreal because she thinks certain things are happening, but you're not sure if they actually are because there's a rumor of demons flying around the village, which are affecting people's judgment and also even changing the dialogue that people hear, which has really strange consequences. I didn't love all of this, but I love the beginning and the foundations of the story. I just wasn't sure about where it went. It kind of veered into the, I'm just going to let you think whatever you like so I don't have to provide you with any answers. Sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. However, I have looked up this author and I've seen they have a new book coming out this summer, which is called, I've just got my computer here, Another Person. This is coming out um, in June. It says, vacuum cleaner bitch. When Gina sees this anonymous comment on a forum, it forces her out of her stupor. It is posted on a website dissecting her public allegations of workplace sexual assault, the backlash to which forced her to quit her job. She has spent months glued to her laptop screen, junk food packaging piling up around her, 
tracking the hate campaign that's raging against her online. I think that sounds brilliant, so I'm definitely going to be reading that. The final book that I read in this section before I start reading others was Divorce by Kim Soon, translated from the Korean by Emily Ye Won, who is normally the translator, at least in the books that I have read, of Huang Yung Jun. So I've read her translation before. This is a book about a woman who, when she was a child, started having dreams that she was going to divorce her husband in the future. But in her dream, her husband was her father. So we flip between memories of her childhood and her parents' relationship and her as an adult divorcing her husband. This title does explore domestic abuse and I thought thematically it was very good, but it's not one of my favorites from this pamphlet series. I have looked up this author and I saw that Kim Soon has one other book that's been translated into English, which is a non-fiction book about sex trafficking. So those are those three and now I'm going to pick up a few others. Hello, I'm back having read two more books. One I liked the premise of, but it kind of petered out for me. And one was bizarre. Okay, so the one that I liked the premise of, actually I liked the premise of both of them to an extent. So the first one is Five Preludes and a Fugue, translated from the Korean by Emily A. Won, and it's by Shio and Haran, and I've looked up this author and nothing else of theirs has been translated into English, as far as I can tell. This is a series of letters between a couple of characters. We have a woman who's about to get married and she wants to learn more about her childhood and her own biological mother who died when she was young. So she's writing to the woman who had a big part in her growing up, and this woman, saw her mother die and she wants her to detail that she wants her to write it down so she can absorb all that information in a way that she's never been able to do before so this woman tries to do that for her who remembers the book shelter by jun young it was huge on booktube i want to say five or six years ago and it opens with a woman rushing into her son's garden in a panic and he sees her out of the window and she's fraught, she doesn't have any clothes on, he doesn't know what is going on and none of the characters know how to react. The beginning of this, the description of this woman watching the mother die is very much like that and I was captivated by that but then the more this went on I, I wasn't as sure about it. I liked it but I didn't love it and then the one that is bizarre is The Transparent Labyrinth by Kishiro Hirano. This is translated from the Japanese by Kira Musa. This is about a man who um, goes from Japan to Budapest on business and then he meets this girl that he fancies in a cafe and she invites him to a party and then they're kind of abducted from this party and taken in a lift and locked in there with other people who were at this party who all appear to be tourists and then they're told that they have to do these really sexually explicit things. It kind of felt like just reading someone's fantasy and um, I tell you what it reminded me of, it reminded me of Sputnik Sweetheart by Haruki Murakami. Just, you know, when you read something and you think, have you ever spoken to a woman before? Have you ever met a queer woman before? Because the way that this author writes about the women in this book is just uh, very much like that. There's this scene that I laughed so much at. When he's in the cafe and he meets this woman who he has a crush on, she's with another woman called Federica who's looking very grumpily at him. And he says, what's wrong with her? And the woman that he's interested in says, oh, her, yeah, she's a lesbian. <laughs> like, that should be enough. That's why she's grumpy. She's queer. <laughs> we are a grumpy species. There was also a twist at the end that I rolled my eyes out that was just quite sexist and um, playing into a certain male fantasy that I just thought was ridiculous. So this one, not so much for me, but we can't love everything, so that's okay. However, I did look up this author and they have written a different book and call me ridiculous, but I'm a bit intrigued by it. Am I just punishing myself? Maybe, but this book, which is called A Man, is about a divorce attorney 
whose own marriage is in danger of being destroyed by emotional disconnect. With a midlife crisis looming, his life is upended by the re-emergence of a former client. She wants him to investigate a dead man, her recently deceased husband, because it turns out he was leading a double life. And investigating this man intrigues him so much that he decides he wants to set out on a double life of his own. I'll probably hate it because it will probably have the same tropey things that this one does and I should resist, but I'm just telling you about it. All right, I have three more left to read. When I have read them, I will return to you. I have now read all 16 books. We had our first DNF in this section, which is a shame, which is by Natsuki Ikezawa. It's called Mariko Marikita. And it just had that vibe of, I don't know how to write women. And I just found it a bit annoying. <laughs> so I decided to stop reading this one. I also read The Wrestler by Jong Sung Tae, which is translated from the Korean by Sora Kim Russell. This is about a man who was a wrestler and now due to injury has amnesia, which gives him a bit of anxiety. And he's been invited back to his hometown for an event and he's worried he won't recognize people. I would recommend this for fans of The Housekeeper and The Professor by Yoko Ogawa. It has obviously similar themes. And then the last one is The Girl Who Is Getting Married by Ayoko Matsuda, who I have read a bit from before. She wrote Where the Wild Ladies Are, which is a collection of feminist ghost stories. It's published by Tilted Axis Press, and I've read a couple of those stories, but not the entire book. This so reminded me of The Woman in the Purple Skirt, which is a book that I wanted to love so much and didn't end up loving. And I kind of felt similarly about this book too. This is narrated by a woman who's talking about the woman who is getting married, who seems to be a friend of hers and she's going to visit her in her flat and she's talking about interactions that they've had in the past. And it gets quite complicated slash comical because she keeps referring to her in full as the woman who is getting married. So, after we left high school, we took different paths. The girl who was getting married and I both moved jobs quite a lot, but we still met up two or three times a year. On one of these occasions, the girl who was getting married announced that she was now a girl who was getting married. The girl who was getting married is getting married and to be told this in a bar on the way home from work, I felt so grown up. A few of my work colleagues had got married, but it never seemed real. Their marriages never had anything to do with me. The marriage of the girl who was getting married was different. If you think that kind of writing is gonna bug you, then maybe stay away from this one. But I found it quite endearing. I don't think I said who this is translated by. It's translated from the Japanese by Angus Turville. I loved the description of the building and the stairs in it being like a dinosaur neck. I thought that that was really fun. But towards the end, again, it did a similar thing to Demons by Kang Quigil, where I said that the ending kind of felt as though the author had gone, okay, I've had enough of trying to figure out what's going on now. I will just lump this story on your lap and you can finish it and I'm done, goodbye. That's how I felt about the ending of this book. It didn't leave me feeling particularly satisfied, but I did find it overall intriguing. All right, so that is my discussion on all of them. I have to pick favorites now. My favorite four from all of these books were Time Differences by Yoko Tawada, which was the one about three queer men in different locations and how they were thinking about each other all the time, but never thinking about relationship relationships that were reciprocal. Then we had Kong's Garden by Huang Junyun, which is the one set at a bookstore about a girl who goes missing. Then we've got Bei Sua's Milena Milena Ecstatic, which is about film and looking at life through a lens. And then finally, I think I would say that this was one of my favorites too, which is Spring Sleepers by Kyoko Yoshida, which is the one about going to a sleep clinic because you have insomnia. So I think those are my top four. I would love to know if you have read any books by this press. You can buy them in sets if you want to. I will link their website in the description box down below. I think that you can buy a whole set of eight 
for £35. I think that's correct. And they have, as I mentioned before, a set of Dutch books in translation and also books from Switzerland. And I believe they have a new set of Japanese books coming out later this year, which I am rather looking forward to. I hope that you enjoyed this video. I would love to know what you've been reading in a comment down below. If you're new to my channel and you would like to subscribe, that would be great. And if you enjoy my content and you would like to consider supporting me on Patreon, that would be very kind. Support on Patreon means I can keep creating free content for everybody on here and it funds my time making everything accessible as well. I will see you next week. Lots of love. Bye.